Hey everybody, it's Mark Masters. It's uh Monday night. It's uh um I don't know <laughs> on my face from dinner. Uh it's always booking comedy, everybody, and we have no guest, and I am going to text the guest right now. And I guess if we don't get a guest, we'll uh we'll figure something out. Let's see. Um Okay, text message sent. Uh, all right, hello. Hello from North Carolina. Uh, until we get our guest, we will um, run through my New England visit. Why don't we do that? I just got back from 10 days in New England. We had a pre-taped episode last Monday because I was doing some TV stuff. Uh, we'll use this as a little reminder as we go. Let's see, can you, can you see me around that? Yeah, kind of. Let's start with Portland, Maine, April 4th. Got a little martini glass. April 4th, Thursday, April 4th, flew in, United flight from Denver, uh, got up super early, was on a show at Comedy Works the night before, and got up at like five in the morning to take a, a early flight in, and uh, landed to a text message that Portland, Maine was closed, uh, something about a snow evacuation or something like that, basically they had a blizzard, had a blizzard, the whole place was closed, and the speakeasy show was canceled. Uh, you were not allowed to have cars on the street. Um, so that was a pretty negative start to the, uh, to the week. But honestly, I was so tired at the moment. I thought, well, uh, this isn't really the end of the world. And, uh, and now we have our guest. So, uh, you're going to have to hear the rest of that story another time. Uh, it's Jake, everybody. How are you, Jake? What's up? I'm doing well. How are you, man? Good, good. Hey, uh, are you, uh, on a cell phone? I am. Try to turn it sideways. Cool. See if it uh if we can get some there we go. Look at that. Sweet. Love it. Love it. Um all right. Uh Jake, you're a San Diego guy. Yes, sir. Yep. Let me turn up the volume here. I can hear you better. How'd you get started in comedy? Um I during the pandemic I was um hosting music concerts in like my friend's backyard as I worked in music for a long time. Um, and since I was just like hosting them, I started kind of just doing stand up. Um, and then I started writing like funny songs to go along with it to, for like my sets. Um, and then like a year into that, um, maybe this started like 2021, but like late 2021, I started just producing comedy shows. Um, and then that was how I started meeting comedians and like getting into, you know, other shows and whatnot. Nice. And and you're a musician by trade, right? Originally. Yeah. You kind of like you're kind of a big deal. Like not a huge deal, but like <laughs> give us an example. Like you you go on tour and you play for how many people? Uh depending on the act, I mean like five hundred to a thousand. Still pretty yeah. small stuff, but like good uh, shows. That's pretty big stuff. For a comic, that's big stuff. For a comic musician, issue. small stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. So you're on stage in front of five hundred thousand people, kind of on the regular. Yeah. Uh, pretty cool. You play the keyboard. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All yeah. right. Awesome. You don't have to call me, sir. Uh, <laughs> so, okay. So you start running comedy shows. That sounds fun. You're meeting some funny people, having a good time. What do you, what's, uh, what's easy and what's hard about running comedy shows in the beginning? Um, well, at the beginning, you don't know what you're doing. So it, like every time, uh, you're learning like how long a crowd can sit in one place and watch a show you're learning how to like craft a lineup that it makes the most sense. You're learning what you can and can't pay people, um, which that's all like the first year was learning all that. Um, and like, it's a, it's a pretty quick curve, you know, of like all of a sudden you made people sit for two hours and they wanted to leave at 75 minutes and you're like, shit, that sucked. Um, but you know, like the crafting the lineups has always been like, something I really enjoy and like making it so that I feel like I want to end every show with people wanting to come back and see more rather than feeling like they were full, you know, yeah. like being like, just leave them where they're like, Oh, I wish one more comic came up. Um, yeah. because the difference between that and, Oh, it was too long is usually one comic. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think that's like really the stuff I was learning at the beginning. And now I think like the hardest stuff is still, I just don't love booking. 
I don't mm. love having shows that people really want to be on. Uh, it stresses me out. I like yeah. don't like getting it's get the, up all the time and saying it's no. The saying no, right? Yeah, exactly. yeah. It's a challenge. It's not the actual booking. The choosing the comics you want probably is kind of fun. Uh, yeah, it's it's the the comics you don't get to say yes to. That yeah. Is stressful. Yeah, it's nice to have something of value. You know, it's always cool when people want to do your show. But it, it, it it's a bummer when people's feelings get hurt. And it, you just feel like a gatekeeper, even though you're really not trying to be, you know? Right. Uh, any any tricks to soften the blow? Um, I, I'm a bad person to ask. I, I'm always... <laughs> He's ripped I, the Band-Aid off. It depends really on like how it's asked. Some, I mean, sometimes I just like don't even open the messages, you know, mm -hmm. and like I know that's not the best way to go about it. But it's like, you know, when you're getting a lot of messages, it's sometimes it's quite frankly, it's just like I just didn't see it. Um, but I think like the best what I tell most people is now is I'm just like, I won't book you until I see you live. And so it's like, mm -hmm. you know, if we're on the same show or or like if you come heavily recommended from someone that I trust, um, I'll definitely give someone a spot. Um, but that's just kind of like my rule of thumb, just because there's so many comics that are, you know, there's no reason to kind of gamble um, on not doing that. Um, and so, so yeah, I just say like, anytime someone hits me up, I'm like, hey, I just need a rec or like, hey, I see that we're both on this show. I'll come see you there. And then, you know. Go so what me. happens when, when you're on the same show with somebody and they're not good? Does that's that happen frequently? Hard. Like, what what's the batting average when you're on the on a show with well, somebody? I mean, I think like as you know, there's like always a room and a lineup for someone who's not quite as strong. You know, like I, I can always. Where like, you, why don't you talk in. about where you put them? Yeah, I, I put them. Uh, I like second. So host first, second is where I put someone who's not as strong, um, and just because it's always the best spot. What's funny is that's the same spot I give to my favorite people. Cause I'm like, have fun. You're going to, you're just going to yeah. eat. Um, but you know, you can slide pretty much anyone in there for five to eight minutes and it won't impact the show. People will forget that spot if it wasn't good. Right. Um, and I think it's really nice to be able to give that opportunity to people who help, you know, or like who want to be on a show who are like really, really kind. I feel like there's people I book who are really, really nice you know, younger comics, like greener comics. So I'm like, yeah, come and work on something, you know, see what it's like to be in front of an awesome crowd instead of at an open mic, you know? Yeah. Cool. Uh, so tell us about the shows that you do run. So uh, right now I was uh, back in like 2021, 2022, I was just running like independent shows. Um, and we were mainly focused at like house shows and wineries. Um, and basically the trouble I kept running into was just, the stress of selling tickets was driving me insane. Mm -hmm. um, and so How much I- were you charging back then? A lot of the times it was just free. You oh, okay. just do tips. So just getting um, butts in the seats was difficult. What were you trying to do to get to uh, fill those seats? We, honestly, we try to find venues that had a clientele base. So like wineries were great because they have big email lists of members. Um, and in San Diego, where like a lot of the wineries are, there's a lot of, you know, pretty good comedy crowds who would come out. And when I say good, it's like, if we got 40 people out to a show, we were pretty stoked. Hmm. Um, and like, sometimes we had 85, sometimes we had 20. Um, but I'd say it like averaged out around 40 to 50. Um, and one of the house shows that was like our flagship, like it was like our best show. It was just like these three guys who are just all really nice guys have this big friend group. So every month they would text their giant friend group and like 70 people every time in like wow. a tiny yard. It was awesome. Nice. Um, but every time we just do like donations, we'd be like, Hey, you can, you know, tip whatever you want. Um, and it was going great for a time. Like we'd make like 600 bucks a show, 700 bucks. And how, you know, how are you collecting the tips? We did Venmo. Okay. We just created like a little, uh, business Venmo account. Um, mm -hmm. And then and you would like way. just announce it on stage. Yeah. And we had like a, we'd have a bucket with like a Venmo scan code that we'd pass around that really changed the game. Hmm. 
is like I, we found when you like hand someone something, they really think to do it. And most people want to tip. It's just very easy to get caught up in a conversation and just, you know, forget to do it or walk right out the door. Right. Um, also, it's like the people whose house we were at um, would often send out the Venmo scan code and they would encourage tipping, which helped a lot because when it comes from like the comics and like the hosts of the show, it can seem a little like beggy. Um, yeah. but when it comes from like the friend whose house it is, everyone's much more, um, I found just receptive. Um, but doing that, uh, was becoming pretty taxing on me and my co-producer at the time. And, um, don't tell was becoming really, really big in San Diego. Um, and they hadn't moved into North County yet. And I, I approached them and said, Hey, like I have a ton of venues. I'm, I'm locked in, ready to go. You know, I, I know a lot of the comics that you have and, um, they just, you know, agreed and they gave me a shot to work for them. And it's, I mean, it's just been great. I love working for don't tell. Um, nice. So that's they, what you do now. Yep. Yeah, well, I, 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 for, if anybody out there has never heard of don't tell, can you summarize it? Yeah. Okay. Um, it, Basically, it's uh, don't tell's like methodology when they like first started was they, they didn't like the idea of having to go to comedy clubs and pay two drink minimums and always have to go downtown for comedy. So the idea was to bring comedy to people and make it more accessible and mainly BYOB shows was how it started. So like people's houses or gyms or museums or whatever. Um, and now it's kind of evolved into like being um, really good for small businesses and uh, just like a really, really cool event. But basically don't tell access like the promoter, they, they have a really good brand and reputation and huge YouTube channel with over a billion views. Um, and they bring in a lot of people. So, you know, we do shows every week. We do like six shows a week in San Diego and they're pretty much always sold out, which is really, really cool. How many days a week are those six shows? Like, which days are they on? We run shows um, Wednesday through Saturday. Wow. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So do you do two on Saturday? Two Friday, Saturday, typically. Not every week we do Wednesday. Um, it just, okay. like, depends on who's in town. But we have three, now four producers, all, like, running shows all around the county. Wow. That's wild. A uh, question from North Carolina is the idea that you buy a ticket without knowing who is performing. Yes. Yeah. Um, it, which honestly, like so much of don't tell is like about the secretive nature of it. Not only do you not know who's performing, but you also don't know where the show is until the day of. So you'll buy a ticket for like Oceanside, San Diego. And the day of it'll be like, Hey, the show is at this brewery, you know, doors at six 30. And you don't know who's on it, and you know. And if you're in a city like San Diego or LA or New York, you know, chances are you're going to see a really, you know, well endowed comic headlining, which is really mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, nice. Um, any, uh, so you've, you're running six shows a week, like almost a hundred people at every show. You're seeing a lot of customers. Any, any crazy experiences with? Yeah, customers? I mean, yeah, like classic, like just having to kick some people out. Um, you What's know. your best story in that area? I, uh, well, I think this goes along with like learning how to be a producer, um, especially when you don't have security at these places, like we're security. Um, and there was one time, it was like a really cool show, like 70 people. Um, and in the front row, this girl, like this really excited blonde girl, she was like really pumped about the show. She's like, I can't wait to see the show. I was like, cool. That's like who you want singing in the front row. But she like wanted to be the star. And so she just like kept heckling. And I like, I don't know why I didn't kick her out, but like, it was one of those heckles where it's like the comics were kind of roasting her and then the crowd was like enjoying it. And it was like, to me, it felt like a fine line between being like, all right, I can kick them out and it won't be like that big of a deal. Or I think the comics are having fun. Anyway, by the end of the show, I realized I should have just kicked them out and I made the wrong call. Um, and so since then, I kick people out pretty quickly. Like I, I pretty much give them two warnings and then you're done. But I had to kick out this really drunk Ukrainian guy um, like a month ago. And I was I, I feel like no one had seen me like pissed off before, but... <laughs> 
I like went up to do my spot in the middle of the show and he heckled me and I like kind of snapped. And then after my set, he heckled again and his buddies like went to the back of the brewery and I went over to his buddies and I was like, go get your fucking friend and get the fuck out of here. You know, I was like so mad. <laughs> um, that's probably like the worst that's happened, but we, we, we honestly don't run into too many, uh, issues most people who come to these shows are like suburban you know yeah pretty people chill. not getting too drunk yeah. Are we people who aren't happy and ask for their money back yeah yeah we we definitely like any comedy event we have people who don't understand what comedy is uh we don't get a lot of people asking for their money back but um what we have is a review system so after the shows you'll get an email that like has um, all the people you saw and then at the bottom it's like hey leave a review and um, we get like you know the occasional I would say like twice a month a one-star review of someone just and you do you see all those reviews or do they get just the bad ones get sent to you we see the good and the bad uh yeah, yeah. and it's funny like you get as many like I would say every three five stars you get one one star it's very rare that you get anything other than a five or a one Huh. Uh, um, and it's funny because you'll often get a five star and a one star from the same show. So, yeah. you know, do, and do you ever change anything because of the one stars? Can you think of any examples? Yeah. Yeah. One show. Um, I just tried to do an outdoor show um, in, I think it was November. And I was like, I don't think it'll be that cold yet. And it was too cold. And uh, that was the review it was like, it was too cold. Mm. And then there was another one that complained about, um, a comic who I was already like on the fence about, um, not like being too edgy, but just like being a little too green. Um, and that was something where I was like, okay, I just got to like give that comic. Like, a. Uh, I think it like that person had seen the comic the week before on one of our shows and that, you know, just said, Hey, you know, some kind of constructive criticism that was, I think received well, but um, a lot of it's more around like weather and like setup of show, like, Oh, I couldn't hear here. Right. The lighting wasn't great, um, but now we we have it pretty well oiled. That um, usually the reviews, if they're bad, are like um, just people who suck. Like they're just yeah. you know they're, they're gonna, upset about it. You know their date didn't go well or something. They're taken out on you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But talk to me about <laughs> light and sound. <laughs> How have you got that dialed in? Like what, um, what have you improved on? I think like sound was never a, a hard thing for me coming from music you mm. know, sound is just for comedy is so easy just plugging a mic um but having two speakers you know and daisy chaining those really elevates a listening experience um and if you can do it every time it's so awesome so that's something that we're trying to get this year is for every producer to have two speakers to you know put on both sides of the stage mm -hmm. um do you ever put a speaker in the rear of the room? Do you have rooms that are big enough for that? No, we, we, I'm sure we, we do have rooms that are big enough for that, but pretty much our, we have like the Vari, the Harbinger Vari 4112, like pretty big, um, mm. just PA speakers. And the two of them will, will take care of a giant room, like a 200 seater, no problem. Um, but lighting was always, like just trickier for me. I feel like it just but took me a while. I, actually, to... sorry, I, I got a yeah. selfish question to ask you since you're a music guy. So yeah. how do you, so they fill the whole room for sure, mm -hmm. but it's definitely louder. The decibel level is higher, closer to the speakers. For sure. So how do you balance like making it loud enough for the people in the back, but not blowing out the ears of the people in the front? Yeah, I think like the higher you can get the speakers above their heads, um, and then also like keeping it just at a distance from the front row, um, okay. helps. So like, you know, if we're in like a big square gym, I'd try to put them in the, in the two corners of the, where the stage is and then have them above ear level, you know? And yeah. so like the nearest person won't be like within, I don't know, six feet to 10 feet of the speaker okay typically 
and then like what I like to do is when the show starts, I just walk to every corner of the space and it's like if it's really, really loud or it's not loud enough, then you can make the adjustment. I think also like setting a speaker outside of the light that is your master speaker so that you can adjust it during the show. That is crucial. If, if like it's an awkward place where you have to like walk up behind the comic to fuck with the mm. speaker, it's it's never great, you know. You always put the speakers in front of the comic, like to prevent feedback uh, or it depends on it, that's obviously ideal. Um, but depending on like where the stage setup is and and whatnot, and if you have two speakers, you can actually just kind of direct them just a little bit, you know, left and right. Okay. Away from the mic, and usually you won't get feedback. Um, mm -hmm. So if you like really want to, you know, put people in tight, and the speakers are more on the sides, you can you can avoid feedback pretty easily. Nice, cool. Okay, I cut you off. You were moving on to lighting. You were going to say something. Oh about yeah, lighting. yeah. Lighting is something that like took me a while to nail, but um, I don't know what the company. But I just got like a spotlight that has a really tight, you know, circular light that you know pinpoints on the comic and it has made such a difference on the way i feel like people feel about the shows it just feels much more professional um and it just looks good like you can see every you know facial expression of the comic and i i love it and i think that was something that i wish i'd done sooner do you have a single or do you converge them from i just have a single okay. uh and then we have two like little square kind of flat podcast lights Okay. Um, that will bring to bigger shows and either like basically light up the wall behind the comic or um, set them up in front just to add a little like more, um, you know, exposure. Yeah. Nice. Um, amazing. Anything. So going from indie show producing to don't tell anything else that you think they do that is awesome that indie show producers can learn from. Um, man, I, I just think, this company is really built out well. They, they have a lot of like forums and um, like little like seminar type things to educate producers on how to produce better. Um, and like town hall meetings where all the producers can get on and people can share, you know, what they do and how, it, how it's better. I think um, the other thing that's really great about Don't Tell is it's like, it's basically an international comedy club that, you know, you can go and do shows all over the town or all over the country. I mean, if you, um, you know, no, don't tell and, and uh, are, you know, past and book with them. Um, but I, I'm just blown away at how well they've marketed and kept up with their reputation. It's really, really cool. It's a, it's a extremely hard thing to do yeah. to sell comedy tickets. Um, and so it's cool that they can do that. That's awesome. Uh, all right, let's talk about some road stories. Uh, I guess this could be comedy or music. You got any yeah. uh, any terrible or very funny uh, road stories for us? Yeah, uh, um, there's a few. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you my least favorite cities, without a doubt, are San Francisco and um, Vancouver, Canada. Okay. Vancouver is funny because it's like so beautiful. And then you get downtown and it is like the scariest place. Uh, like it besides like Philly, you know, or like certain parts of LA and Chicago, I guess. But like, I, I guess you just don't expect Vancouver to be like covered with heroin needles. And we saw a bunch of bar fights. Mm. Uh, I just never experienced something like this where um, it was just so violent the entire time we were there. Um, mm. And like you, for bands, you get like a, um, you get like an email from the venue day of that tells you where to like load in and stuff. And it, there were so many warnings on it that were just like, don't like leave your car unlocked, don't stand outside in the alley, you know, like all these things. So I was like, Jesus Christ, and it was like real. <laughs> um, so that was spooky. I, I feel like I'd never really seen. We were like, as we we're pulling in, these two guys in front of a bar were just in an argument, and one just punched the other one like square in the face. I was like. It was crazy. I'd never seen that at like that time of day too. It was like 6 p.m. I was like, anyway, bizarre. But um, at the beginning of touring, when you're like still trying to sleep on people's couches and stuff, um, those are always like the worst. Like when um, we were in Santa Cruz and we were like 24 
and we have six band members or five band members and then um like a tour manager and um this kid offered us to stay at what he called the halfway house he was like oh there's a halfway house and we can house all of you guys and we're like that sounds great like you know a place where it'll be pretty chill because we're so tired we're like halfway through like a four-week tour um and we get to this place and it's not a halfway house it's like a masonic lodge and um there's like drugs everywhere and trash everywhere and the bathroom doesn't work this kid like as soon as he walks in walk in he's like hey by the way you can't take shits in here the toilet doesn't work and we're like okay and they're like if you need to pee just go onto the balcony and pee off the railing and we were like what the hell it, it was it was just the worst and like there were so many situations like that where we just ended up in places where I hope to never be again. <laughs> um, or at least have a little more money or a little yeah, bigger budget. We're in yeah. hotels now. So yeah. that hey, that's great. We, we got a question from online. As a performer, do you travel in a similar fashion for comedy shows as you do for music when you're performing, doing shows? Like how is comedy travel similar or different from music travel? Yeah, I think, I'm not at a point in my comedy career where I'm like selling enough tickets where I'm making a lot of money. Um, so it's like when I'm going on the road, I'm just doing like, you know, don't tells or spots at like clubs that I know. Um, so like if I do a weekend with like four shows, I'm lucky to walk away with like 250 bucks. Um, and fortunately I'll try to like string in a jazz gig in there, which typically can make me a little more money. Um, so that definitely changes like a budget. Uh, and when I travel for comedy, I, I'd still like to stay with friends. The nice part is it's just me. So when I go to like Austin or New York, it's really, really easy to stay with a friend. Um, and like the impact on their life isn't, you know, intense. Um, when we, when I travel for music now, um, the guy who I play with the majority of my time, he, he does well enough that we can afford hotels every single night, which is really, really nice. Um, but I'm just always blown away at how much easier comedy is to travel and do than music. Like, and even as like a music comic, all I do is literally I need one outlet for my keyboard and I just plug into whatever speaker they have. It's so simple. Um, where for music we load in at two and we basically work until the show and then we pack everything down and drive again where comedy is a lot more fun it, it like it certainly is the money is worth the hours you're putting in um and so i'm excited to see the moment like where i could sell out a, a you know even a small club like even if you can sell i think if you can sell out 25 to 50 tickets everywhere you go you could at least be doing okay you know you could maybe pay for cheap hotels or something yeah Cool. Yeah, for sure. That's awesome. Especially if you control so much of that comes down to venue relationships. Like if you're if you can book your own space and keep the door and maybe just like pay them a fee because you know you're gonna sell all the tickets, that's really the way to go. When you're going through a club or whatever, you know, you're getting a fraction of all the money that's for sure. it's brutal and tricky. Yeah. yeah if they can sell the tickets for you that's like always this game until you are you're a marquee name that sells tickets it's will they sell a bunch of tickets for me so i have a great crowd or right. will i do all that work and make the most money you know so yeah exactly um all right well uh to, here's a question for aspiring uh comedians with a background in music uh any advice specifically for those types do it and don't be super embarrassed about being a music comic um like i think for me i always felt and still i feel like like a prop comic or like a hack a lot of times and i think uh i really don't feel that way anymore funny is funny um and i think it's important to work on your stand-up and not just do music stand-up all the time but i think um like really work on your writing. Don't just be someone who says stupid words while music is behind you. Like if you're going to write a funny song, try to have it have as many punchlines as you can possibly think of so that even if you just read the lyrics out loud, it would be funny or like the idea is funny. Have a premise, have a point. Um, and uh, 
uh, I think just like practice your instrument. I really think that that will help overall the music community and comedy community have a better relationship. Um, Cause I think it's really cool when you see a music comic who's really, really good at their instrument. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, just like make it, make your build out compact, you know, have, if you want to be a keyboard comic, get a keyboard that's light enough that you can carry it everywhere. Yeah. Um, is then you'll, then you'll do it. You'll bring it everywhere. And then, you know, anyway. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. All right. Uh, that's, that's about it. How can people find you? Short Jake's on Instagram. Um, that's really the best. And well, short uh, Jake taken. Or you're just plural. Yeah, short or... Jake. There's a Jake short out there who took that. So yeah. short Jake S is me. Okay. Uh, and then I just I post stuff on YouTube, and that's just short Jake on YouTube. And uh, I got some like cool music and stuff coming out this year. So yeah, stay oh, tuned. Oh yeah, subscribe, sign up. Uh, awesome. Well, this was a lot of fun. Keep killing it in San Diego. And thanks for all the intel on Don't Tell. And, yeah. And and music travel. And this was a great episode. Thank you so oh. much. Uh, thanks, thanks everybody who tuned in and uh, we'll be back next Monday. Uh, we're going to